Hi, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for joining us for the first of two of our prize winners' talks um, as part of the fourth annual Grinnell College Young Innovators for Social, uh, for Social Justice Prize Award. Um, my name is Okwemi Awe, and I'm a fourth year, I'm the SGA president, um, and it is my honor to introduce this evening um, Lindsay Stradley and Ani Valabeneni. Yeah, boy. All right, who are co-founders of Sanergies. Um, by now, I'm sure that you are all thoroughly impressed by the work that Lindsay, Ani, and their team do um, in addressing Kenya's severe waste management problems. Sanergy does this by building and franchising fresh life toilets that improve sanitation and public health, create jobs, and convert waste into valuable byproducts. This project, which emphasizes social entrepreneurship as a mechanism of social change, is an incredible case study for the sort of change that I think many nations are in need of. Not only is Sanergy addressing a public health crisis, but they are doing so in a way that is economically sustainable and allows Kenyans to profit from the change that is directly benefiting from them. Ironically, or not so much ironically, um, that is exactly what I hope to spend my life doing, um, but on like the west side of the continent. Uh, so I feel particularly connected to these winners. Um, in addition to the fact that I so passionately support their practical, de their practical development model, I've also been a secret supporter of Sanergy for going on two years now. Um, when, what Lindsay and Ani didn't know until like yesterday was that during my time as a student researcher for the um, Social Justice Prize, I was tasked with presenting my findings to the prize selection committee. So um, for those of you who are, who are unfamiliar, we get hundreds and hundreds of applications and they sort of whittle it down, whittle, 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 until finally there's like a selection committee and student researchers are tasked with doing extensive research and then presenting it to the committee. Um, so although we're not supposed to have favorites or express any bias whatsoever, um, and they really don't care about our opinions, um, Sanergy clearly em emerged as my um, prefer preferred organization. And as the process progressed, however, the prize committee really had to make the difficult decision to choose last year's really wonderful, really illustrious winners, um, much to my chagrin. But um, although I was disappointed, I certainly knew that this would not be the last that I heard of Sanergy and their amazing work. So I was then incredibly excited to hear that this year, um, Sanergy was subsequently chosen as a prize winner. And I was even more thrilled because I know that this represents a continuation and an expansion of the innovative and groundbreaking work that Synergy continues to do in Kenya. Um, I applaud you for your hard work and your persistence both in Kenya and with the Grinnell College Prize Committee. Um, uh, with all that being said, for their exemplary work in addressing critical public health needs in Kenya and doing so in an economically and environmentally sustainable fashion, please join me in welcoming Synergy co-founders Lindsay Stradley and Ani Valabeneni. Give us a minute here while we fire this up. Um, such a warm welcome, thank you. Okay. Um, it's been an incredible honor to be here um, this week. It's nothing but such warm hospitality from all of you, uh, from everyone who picks us up in the hotel every morning and makes sure we don't get lost anywhere on campus. Uh, it's been incredible. Um, let me see if I don't mess this up. All right, laptop. All right. <clears throat> Turn down. What's up? Oh, there we go. Yep. Cool. Um, well, thank you everyone for coming here tonight. Um, on behalf of our 180 teammates back in Nairobi, we're, it's really our pleasure to share with you uh, what we're doing at Synergy, which is really building healthy and prosperous communities uh, by making hygienic sanitation affordable and accessible in uh, Africa's informal settlements. Now, before we get started on what Synergy does, Sarah had asked us to share you know, how we got here tonight, you know, what, what brought us, you know, what, what are all the moments in our lives that brought, uh, brought us here to this moment? And, you know, and actually started thinking about that, you know, and I think we, we, we uh, we're here because, you know, there's this prize for social justice and it got me thinking, well, what is social justice and where did this all get started? And, you know, and the reason that all of you guys are here is because you care about social justice. And so it's just digging around online and, and, and you know, and actually, I guess it, it all starts here with this guy, Luigi Tapparelli, who was an Italian Catholic priest in 1843, um, who was credited with coining the term social justice. Um, 
And you know, though the exact definition of social justice has changed and evolved over the last century, I think the core of it still remains the same, which is uh, morality and economics, right? Morality and how we share and distribute the resources that we as society have. And you know, just three years after Taparelli really fashioned this concept or made it popular, interestingly, you know, the 11, uh, the 11 uh, abolitionist, abolitionist ministers started Grinnell College with social responsibility and social justice as its core tenets. And, um, you know, and I think it's, it's continuing in these principles that uh, the Grinnell Prize was started uh, four years ago uh, and how we all find ourselves here tonight uh, in, in this room. So now that you're here and you don't really have a choice and the doors are closed and you have to listen to me, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my life and Lindsay, and Lindsay's going to tell you a little bit about her path and, and how we got here. So <clears throat> just uh, another disclaimer before we start this, because we're talking about sanitation, um, some of the images may be sensitive, so please try to hold your dinner down uh, while, uh, while we go through this presentation. Um, so I grew up in a small city uh, on the east coast of India, uh, and scenes like this were very commonplace. Um, in fact, I think it was so commonplace that I never even stopped to think about this when I was growing up. Right. Uh, sanitation was and still is inaccessible to millions of uh, citizens in India, and despite years of aid and, and work and, uh, uh, and money being uh, put into it, poor governance and uh, planning for 40 years after India's independence, when, and you know, this is when I was still living there, uh, left cities bursting with people uh, but little to no infrastructure to support them. You know, at the same time, I spent a lot of time in, uh, at my, grandmother, uh, my grandparents' place in the village, uh, where we had about a dozen cattle. Um, and just like many of our neighbors, we used to pick up the dung from the cattle in the cattle shed and put it into this contraption. Um, and, 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 you know, never thought twice about it. All our neighbors had it. Uh, it magically made some gas that we used for cooking our food every night. And, uh, again, you know, these, some of these things are so commonplace to me when I was growing up that it didn't seem like anything interesting at all, but little did I know that both of these experiences um, would form some of the core ideas for Sanergy, you know, and, and on the lack of access to sanitation and anaerobic digestion, converting waste materials to energy and so on. So that's part of uh, sort of the, or, I guess, the origin story of, you know, how all of these came, all of this, some of this came together. And then I went off to the U.S. and uh, uh, immigrated to the U.S. and left all that behind. I studied computer science and finance uh, at WashU in St. Louis, and I worked in tech startups for a number of years uh, with no inkling or interest to solve any global problem at all, and perfectly happy uh, in front of my computer and coding away, uh, until several years later when I had moved to the Philippines because I had an interesting opportunity to run a chain of dialysis clinics for low-income patients. Uh, and when I was there, this is what I found, right? Uh, and it really woke me up. You know, 20 years later, you know, after I'd moved out of India, you know, even very modern cities like Manila, which has huge highways, the fanciest of air-conditioned malls with, uh, you know, with Prada and Louis Vuitton stores, more than half the uh, city is living in slums like this uh, with sanitation, nothing more than a long drop into the river, which is the same place where you see people washing their clothes just you know, a little bit further downstream or getting water. And that's when I uh, started initially exploring the problem uh, of urban sanitation. And I left the Philippines to attend graduate school at MIT uh, and with no idea on how to solve this problem, but something that it was, you know, was really, um, I guess, uh, you know, stuck in the back of my mind, something that we wanted to work on. And in conversations with other classmates, um, uh, interest in social entrepreneurship, uh, particularly Lindsay, uh, I found other crazy people also interested uh, in solving this massive global problem, and that's how we started to develop Synergy, and that's, uh, my, you know, that's part of my story. And Lindsay's going to talk now about a little bit about what brought her here and what we're doing at Synergy. And I'll come back and kind of um, walk you through the last bits of where, what we're doing today and where we're going from here, um, and you know, then we'll be happy to have your questions. Great. <clears throat> so rewind again. We'll come back to, to MIT and Synergy in a couple minutes. Um, my own journey began more than a decade ago when I sat essentially where you guys sit now. 
Um, as a college student at Yale, I focus on issues of urban poverty. And outside the classroom, I started to work for a young organization called All Our Kin. Uh, it trains low-income uh, mothers to be certified early childhood educators um, and supports them in launching their own home-based daycare centers. So in doing so, it creates both a, a solid, steady income for the women um, and provides really world-class education to their children and, and the other children that they are educating. Um, so in those few years that I worked there, I witnessed uh, this whole idea of um, kind of systemic community-wide impact that a single program could have by building strong communities and really thinking about how do you create communities and networks um, that can kind of go beyond you know, one isolated problem. Um, in the meantime, I also had kind of a front row seat to the two amazing leaders who created this organization. Um, and you know, today they've really built the organization into a strong um, voice and force for, for families and for communities. Um, but that all began, or they sort of got their start through um, an organization called Teach for America. And um, wanting to be just like them, um, when I graduated um, from, uh, from Yale, I also joined Teach for America. Um, and so I was assigned to teach uh, high school math in New Orleans, and there I received another really amazing mentor. And this is Barbara McPhee. Uh, she's the founder and the principal of the school where I taught. Um, and through during the time that I worked under her, uh, through my work in the classroom, um, I was this time firsthand really able to to build leaders who I could see making an impact immediately in their communities. So again, this whole idea of, OK, you have this organization. It's uh, kind of empowering people to build communities that can solve broader social problems. Um, and I just loved the work. I had uh, just begun teaching my third year um, in New Orleans when Hurricane Katrina struck the city. And obviously, it, it devastated the city uh, that had become my home and forced millions of people, you know, hundreds of thousands of families, to evacuate. Um, Barbara and I immediately recognized that in order for New Orleans to rebuild, schools would have to reopen and families would have to return home. Bit of a chicken and egg. So together we founded the New Orleans uh, Charter Science and Math High School, uh, the first high school to reopen after the hurricane. Um, and as Barbara, who again just uh, this amazing uh, uh, spunky leader um, has said, running a charter school in post-Katrina environment is like being a mayor of a small town. You have to fix everything yourself. Um, and it was a complex and exhausting job, and it was definitely um, my training for everything that we do now uh, at Synergy um, and you know, starting a social enterprise and in the informal settlements um, actually probably has a little more structure to it than uh, starting a school in post-Katrina at New Orleans. Um, that the whole experience left me determined really to seek uh, another environment where I thought I could learn to lead and grow an equally complicated organization, um, maybe in a little bit calmer setting. Um, so moving from New Orleans, um, I joined Google. Um, at the time, Sheryl Sandberg, who's now the CEO of Facebook, um, was the driving force behind Google's primary revenue driving, um, revenue generating division. The, it's called online sales and operations. Um, and I really wanted to learn from her and from what I saw as this kind of innovative private sector company that I wanted to go back then and kind of apply what, what they must be doing right. This is 2006, um, you know, what they're doing right back to the social problems that, that I saw. Um, so I became one of the initial members of Google's first uh, US sales and operate, sorry, East Coast uh, sales and operations team. Um, I spent three years there, helped grow that office to about 300 people. Um, so it was like my second entrepreneurial experience. This time was a little bit better funded, a, a little more stable than, than the first one. Um, and you know, by that time realized that, that I was really ready to, to start my own initiative or to look for the partners and the ideas um, that uh, maybe were, were already there um, and you know, become a leader within that. So I left Google. Here we are back where Rodney left us off uh, to attend graduate school at, at MIT. Um, again, really just in search of the inspiration to start that initiative. Um, and in conversations with other classmates interested in social uh, entrepreneurship, 
particularly Ani, um, I learned more and more about um, another facet of urban poverty that I hadn't focused on really um, professionally or academically till that point, which is the global sanitation crisis. I will reinforce what Ani said earlier. Some, you know, if you're, you're still eating, just prepare yourself. We're gonna give you a quick primer in the global sanitation crisis. Um, so globally, about two and a half billion people lack access to adequate sanitation, which is really to say they lack access to anything that anyone in this room would recognize as a toilet. Um, so at Sanergy, we work in Kenya's urban informal settlements where about eight million people lack access to clean water and uh, hygienic toilets. So before Sanergy, residents in Nairobi's uh, slums had three main sanitation options. The first, when they lack any access to sanitation facilities, um, people use flying toilets. Um, imagine defecating into a plastic bag in your own home. You have the privacy of walls around your home. Um, and then waiting for an opportune moment to discreetly dispose of the bag onto your street. So that's a flying toilet. Um, and that would be the most common, sadly, the, the most common um, sanitation option, uh, particularly at, at night um, in the communities where we work. The second, people um, can pay to use makeshift public toilets, so pit latrines, sometimes hanging toilets, um, not really much different in terms of waste disposal than the images that, that Ani showed, um, you know, but you do get essentially a sense of privacy, um, you know, sort of walls around you, um, varying degrees of cleanliness, usually not so much, um, but uh, they are still a, a pay for use almost all the time, so you'll pay you know, a few shillings, just like a few cents to, to use lovely facilities like these here. Um, and the third option um, is that sometimes people can use public toilets, like the ones here on the left, um, that are located in commercial areas. And they're certainly better than those last two options, but they're usually poorly cleaned and poorly maintained, um, and they're a really long walk from residential areas. Um, and those long walks are not only inconvenient, um, none of us want to have a long walk when you need to go to the bathroom, but particularly at night, they are dangerous and put uh, women and, and children in particular at risk of sexual assault or other violence. Um, in fact, Amnesty International, the report here on, on the right, um, reports that women don't want to walk more than about 100 meters to reach a toilet at night, and uh, I think our work has shown that's a gross overestimate. You know, it's really probably uh, 25 meters or so, um, if even that. So, in place of these three options, I will put them at that in quotes, um, at Synergy, we've developed high quality, low cost toilets that we franchise under our Fresh Life brand to local entrepreneurs, um, also to, to residents, um, and to community institutions like schools and health clinics. Each Fresh Life operator who purchases a Fresh Life toilet gets a business in a box that provides uh, all the materials needed to open and operate a successful Fresh Life business from day one. So marketing materials, cleaning supplies, a hand washing station, uniform, all these lovely things you see here. Um, and then we further bundle the Fresh Life toilet and the business in a box with a comprehensive set of services. So the first of those is marketing support. We provide you know, customized marketing support to each of our franchisees, each Fresh Life operator, um, and really focus on aspirational messaging. Um, we run events like uh, we, uh, Fresh Life toilet opening ceremonies, uh, soccer tournaments, um, and uh, we even have our, I don't know if you heard before we began, we have a couple times played, there's a song playing, that's, that is the Fresh Life song, um, which you can occasionally hear on the radio or at events. Um, so all really focused on very kind of um, aspirational branding, much uh, I mean, trying to be quite similar to what you'd see for um, a prominent global brand. And in fact, um, Things like the uh, wall branding are, again, uh, very similar marketing and branding techniques that you know, you know, Coca-Cola or other large brands um, in the communities where we work use. So really trying to say, hey, this is um, not just a little bit better than those other options you had, but um, a high-quality aspirational brand that people really want to be associated with. Um, our team further provides Fresh Life operators with upfront training 
and weekly business support to ensure that they're generating as much customer demand as possible, both because we want um, to be reaching as many people as possible with hygienic sanitation, and we also want, of course, all of our franchisees to be successful and sustainable um, <laughs> entrepreneurs. Uh, we also provide, thanks to Kiva, which is an online uh, micro-lending platform, um, uh, financial support and financing support. So our Fresh Life operators are able to receive uh, no interest loans um, through the Kiva platform, um, and we also build other partnerships with local microfinance institutions to provide as many financing options as possible to make this purchase um, you know, accessible to uh, the, the communities where we work. And so, Kind of as a result of this whole comprehensive package, our, our Fresh Life operator is making about $1,000 in profit <coughs> per year per Fresh Life toilet, and, and most of our franchisees have two facilities, so uh, you know, on average you're making about $2,000 per year. Um, it's just one story, sort of back to um, where I started in all of this, thinking about some of the women in the communities and uh, how do you create these communities in order to really solve um, really uh, persistent social problems. Um, this is Hannah Muthoni, who was one of our very first Fresh Life operators. And before Synergy and Fresh Life started in the community, she traveled more than an hour every day to sell goods at, at a market. Um, and she's now able to provide high quality sanitation to her family and her neighbors and earn, um, actually, she has a very thriving business. Uh, she earns a, you know, quite a good income um, while staying home to take care of her grandson, who, who you see here. Um, and in fact, she uh, was so successful initially that she's added on additional Fresh Life Toilet and, and some other kind of retail businesses to, um, to her overall kind of, uh, business. Um, so again, really creating the opportunities, in this case, for her family, for her daughters, um, to have outside jobs while um, improving the health and the, the income for her family. And that's an example of um, the, the kind of community and systemic impact that we're having through, uh, through Synergy and through Fresh Life. So the toilets are a big part of what we do, but unfortunately that's not the entire uh, solution to the problem because uh, you know, what happens to the waste once it's in the toilets and all the other options before, uh, whether it's the flying toilets or the public toilets, uh, what we have is about four million tons of sludge every year that's dumped into the environment from just from Kenya slums. And that's just eight million of the over billion people living in slums worldwide. Um, and just in the wider city itself, 96% of the sludge in Nairobi is not treated. Even if it goes to wastewater treatment plants, it's just put back out into the environment because of um, infrastructure that's broken down or a complete lack of infrastructure to begin with. So at Synergy, we're taking a very innovative uh, systems-based approach to building out what we call the entire sanitation value chain. And you know, we talked a lot about the first part of that, which is the sanitation facilities and how we deploy those into the communities using our franchising model. Uh, so that's uh, the second part of it is where we collect the waste from each of the facilities and safely remove it from the community to our central processing facility. And here at the processing facility, we converted it, the waste into saleable byproducts like organic fertilizer and renewable energy, thus closing the loop uh, as well as making the whole model financially uh, sustainable. And we can do this effectively because of our pragmatic engineering. And uh, uh, for example, our prefab concrete toilets that you see here uh, are manufactured locally. They're high quality, durable, and aesthetically uh, appealing. Uh, but more importantly, we've developed an innovative cartridge-based sludge management system that you see on the right side uh, that allows us to safely and easily remove the sludge even from the deepest parts of the communities where you can't even access it with a wheelbarrow, let alone an exhaustion truck or a vacuum truck that you might be more familiar with here. So that uh, cartridge system, uh, like I said, you know, allows us very easily uh, to remove the sludge from the communities uh, and get it out to our processing facility where we use uh, world-class technologies to convert it into useful byproducts. Right now we're consolidating over 3,000 tons of sludge at our treatment facility that um, uh, this is a machine that we've licensed from a company in Singapore that allows us to convert the sludge into fertilizer in 24 hours with some proprietary technology that they've developed. And this fertilizer is actually changing a lot of lives. Uh, these byproducts itself are hugely powerful in changing a lot of lives. 
Uh, we market this fertilizer under our Farmstar brand, um, and this, uh, this line of high quality organic fertilizers is drastically improving depleted soils uh, and, and increasing agricultural yields for farmers across Kenya. So uh, all along the value chain, you know, what we're trying to do is create jobs and opportunity while addressing significant social, environmental, and economic challenges. And, through our work, we've, uh, you know, we, in the past, just in the past three years, we've launched over 500 uh, sanitation facilities to about 250 entrepreneurs. Uh, we're providing sanitation to about 23,000 people every single day and about 3,800 tons of sludge that we've safely removed from the community and diverted them from polluting the environment and destroying community health. Uh, but most importantly, I think, you know, we're strong believers that economic development happens with good reliable jobs, and we've created over 525 jobs. Uh, in, in Kenya, that face, uh, a country uh, that faces 40% unemployment, a uh, majority of our staff are actually youth, uh, which face 75% unemployment rates in, in Kenya. Uh, so you know, it, what we're trying to develop here and continue to scale up, and we're, there's always so much more learning and so much more uh, improvements to be done with the model, but uh, something that's not just looking at sanitation uh, in, in its, as a solitary problem to solve, but really looking at why are these problems, how are these problems interconnected with everything else and how do we solve uh, lots of different problems together because I think oftentimes you'll find solution for one problem is actually uh, a, you know, some, a problem somewhere else and trying to fit those together. And that's really the models we focus on. So that's what we do at Synergy, but uh, last thing we have to do a plug for ourselves, which is uh, we have a great fellows program, an intern program, uh, and it's an opportunity for dynamic and adventurous and talented individuals such as yourself to apply your skills and expertise to one of the greatest problems I think that our generation faces, uh, which is 40% you know, of the world not having access to a basic service like sanitation. So we're looking for fellows from all uh, interns, uh, part-time uh, from all disciplines, um, you know, whether you're liberal arts, engineering, uh, basic sciences, what, wh whichever one that might be. Uh, you know, we'd love for you to come and spend at least three months with us in East Africa, but um, we're very flexible. Um, and we have actually, it's not just limited for students, it's for all of you. Uh, we have a whole range of uh, people that come and join us. So, for example, um, Jessica is a graduate student at, uh, G at um, Hopkins, right? Uh, Dennis, who's on the bottom right, bottom left, to okay. you, right, to you. Uh, he, he, he used to be the uh, VP of innovation at McDonald's, and he took a sabbatical from his job to come spend uh, several months with us, uh, and he's going to continue to uh, engage with us. And then we have uh, local engineers like Godwin on the left, uh, bottom left, and uh, experienced uh, Patrick, who's uh, spent 10 years at KPMG and took a mid year, mid career break to come and spend time with us. So uh, is, this really isn't limited to students. So. You know, we have very well-scoped projects. There hasn't been a smart, passionate person we haven't been able to make use of. So please uh, visit us on the website, or feel free to drop Lindsay or me an email. Our email addresses are there. We'd love for you to, you know, not just support us from Grinnell, but come join us uh, in Nairobi and, and really change the, you know, help us change the face of sanitation in Africa's slums. So thank you.